Every January, several hundred learning and design professionals gather in London for the Learning Technologies Conference. This year, Donald Clark, Nigel Payne, and I led discussions about informal learning in Web 2.0. Here are a few outtakes from the conference. Raise your hand if you feel you're so busy that you don't have time to reflect on your experience. Woo! You're going to enjoy the, the, the last section of this, I can assure you. That was most of the people in the room. psychology in the whole 20th century in 1998, showing that all, almost everything that had been published in parenting was hokum, all that stuff about, you know, Freudian attachment theories and so on, that basically used parents, if you've got kids, have absolutely no effect on, the, on your child at all. By and large, 50% of it's genetic. The other 50% is mostly peer group. Send your kid to school. I have two kids. They don't have a Scottish accent, believe me. They were brought up in England. They have the accent of a peer group. You have more, give more credibility to your colleagues than to an instructor or somebody in authority who's trying to lay their message on you. Time is moving so fast that scientist and inventor Ray Kurzweil says that in this century, we're not going to have a hundred last century type of years. We're going to have 20,000 of them. The changes, the briefest change is really exaggerated. So we're not able to pinpoint the way we used to try to do, man plans, God laughs, uh, the way we tried to, you know, foresee the future. Every bugger thinks that they have a right to self-realization now. Once upon a time, the only people who thought that were the extremely rich kings or princes who thought, I have a right to make an impact on the world, and people incredibly poor, monks and nuns who didn't have anything to lose, therefore they could spend their life in contemplation and self-realization. For the rest of us, it was all a bit of a grind. Now, we all expect it. And we expect it not just in the rest of our lives, but we expect it as part of our work life as well. We expect work to be fulfilling, to make us happy, to give us something challenging, to make an impact, all of those things. And does it? Not for about 60% of people. I did. And evolution can take care of things that our best engineering can't even comprehend. This is the old college path experience where a new campus is built and they don't build any sidewalks because the planners don't know where they should really go. And they'll let students walk on the grass for a year. Wherever they've worn down, that is the place that they build the sidewalks. They end up with an optimal pattern that way. You know, the group or network that person has will either just be, it's not ad hoc in a way. It happens to be the people they were sitting next to, the people they went on a training course together, or the people they were introduced to in their induction course, if they got one at all. So it's very, very ad hoc, your exposure to other people in an organization. And yet, the whole point is to optimize teamwork and that group socialization. Empathy is something that lives within organizations and empathy is something you've either got or you haven't got and we can all give massive examples of organizations with absolutely diddly squat empathy. Conversation. Yeah, conversation's truly magical. I, science really doesn't understand why it's as good as it is, but it's when you're looking somebody in the eye and when your mirror neurons are hooking up and when you've got emotion as well as content and when it's specifically what you, what you direct it into, conversation is incredibly powerful. We always want to encourage conversation to transfer learning. 
there are thousands and thousands of these companies using this stuff now. And nobody is going to convince me that this is a waste of time. All that money spent by the training community over decades on communication courses, desperately trying to get people to communicate with each other, along comes some very simple, cheap, almost free software that does it for them, and they do it off their own bat. And what's the first reaction of an HR department? To ban it. To ban it. The HR department is supposed to be about people development and communication and growth in an organization are seen as people who are willing to give up space to be able to be close to the seat of power. So there was no place for people to talk. I'd say, look, you want people to talk? Take a third of these damn cubicles, throw them away, put in leather sofas, espresso machines, rolling whiteboards. People will start to talk. I mean, people love to converse. You've just got to let it happen. Encourage it a little bit. And blogs are one form of social communication that really do work. Whether it's senior managers in an organization, and some pretty senior people have blogged very successfully here, it's perfectly natural for people to have a voice, you know, an authentic voice in the organization that's them, not some stuff produced by the marketing department. If you say that your product is beta, your customers are helping you improve it. They find something wrong, it's an opportunity for them to say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you fix that? So that gives you guidance on improving the product, but it also means that instead of skeptics, you've got disciples. I can't think of many things in business that shouldn't always be considered beta. Some of you are probably saying, well, this guy's from California, uh, lives by Silicon Valley. We, you know, it's interesting stuff. We're going to wait a while. You know, we, we'll, we'll wait a couple of years, see how this one works out, maybe stick our toe in the water, you know? Well, I'll tell you, if you do that, you're going to fail. You got a, a really crappy course on sexual harassment that nobody wants to go along with. Then perhaps, you know, if you're a guy, get a female avatar on Second Life and hang out for a couple of days in Second Life, you'll really get to know what it's like to be a woman. Believe me. <laughs> Uh, because this is the real, it's not the real world, but it, it's more accurate than a training course, believe me. You're not going to teach sexual harassment from a PowerPoint or a bloody flip chart in a classroom. Now, the very people in charge of learning become the greatest bottleneck because they stand up and say, we have to approve it. We have to put it on our site. And of course, if you want to explode learning all around the organization, you can't end up the bottom there. You have to be the helper, the facilitator, and perhaps someone who just holds up your hands and says, take a deep breath and see what happens. And then, uh, Jay, I think Jay's in the audience somewhere. Yes, okay. Jay's up the back here. Oh, a great debt to Jay on this one. You know, this whole spending paradox idea. You know, we don't learn all of what we learn in training courses or by going to school and university. Most of what we learn, teaching is not a necessary condition for learning. Most of what we learn in the workplace is informal. Jay's great insight, and he quantified it and pointed at the paradox. All of the money is spent on formal learning, and yet we know, we know empirically, that most of the learning is informal. And yet what do we do with most of the informal tools? We try and ban them. We create an environment, and providing we've framed it correctly, we let them loose. And when you let people loose, they rarely let you down. Rarely let you down. For another, the returns on some of these things are, you know, you're not talking about 20% better, you're talking about 1,000% better. It is phenomenal. If you can't explain the value of one of these projects on the back of your envelope, find another project.